Greetings and welcome to another edition of The Pedal Shift Project. The Pedal Shift Project is a series of conversations, thoughts, and experiments around the bike touring lifestyle, from tips and tricks to ideas on how to ride your ride. Let's shrink the world by bike. Show notes and more are available at pedalshift.net slash 076, and you can email the show, pedalshift at pedalshift.net. Check out Pedal Shift as well on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram. Hi, I'm Tim Mooney, back for the 76th edition of the Pedal Shift Project, and it's a beautiful, sultry night here in Washington, D.C. Uh, we hit 85 degrees Fahrenheit today, which is just crazy for early spring like this, early April. This is more like middle May. This is like Memorial Day weekend, so it's got me thinking about summer a little bit, so I'm kind of excited about that. On this episode of the Pedal Shift Project, we've got follow-ups from stuff in past episodes, and we've also got two, not one, but two tour journals that I'll be going through. One is my tour of the CNO, a follow-up on all of that, and then the second is a listener writing in about her experience on the Katy Trail with her dog in tow. So let's get cracking. First up in follow-ups, we've got some news on the bridge in Big Sur. That bridge that used to be just be kind of damaged but sort of there and kind of freaky uh, it is now completely removed. They took it down, which frankly was probably all for the best because I think it up being up certainly was getting people thinking, huh, maybe I could cross that on foot or by bike. And um, it was really, really dangerous. They actually removed the whole thing. Um, the good news about that is maybe what that means is that they're really serious about replacing that very quickly, like in the matter of weeks or months, as opposed to years. Uh, I can't imagine it would go that long because it's such an important bridge and it's such an important thoroughfare there on California Highway 1. But we will see what ends up happening with all of that. Um, newsletter subscribers, you got, uh, this month's the April newsletter. And, uh, if you, by the way, if you're not a newsletter subscriber, I put it out sort of on the off weeks. I, I, I do three podcasts a month now. And, uh, on the off, on the off weeks, you get this cool newsletter with some little bit of extras, maybe some extra photos, stories, things like that. Well, the one thing I learned about my newsletters, uh, program, my app, my, uh, the website, whatever you want to call it. It's got an autocorrect, which does not understand the name of my dog. My dog's name is Bell Star with two R's. That is very important because she is named after the outlaw queen of Oklahoma, who spelled her name S-T-A-R-R. And unfortunately, the newsletter said S-T-A-R. I found this out when Kimberly read the newsletter and was horrified that I misspelled the dog's name. Of course, I didn't do it. It was autocorrect. I'm, I'm blaming you, autocorrect. But I am going to throw myself on the sword for not picking it up in the editing process. So autocorrect, bane of my existence. And clearly, I am simultaneously a poor editor and a bad dog daddy. One more piece of follow-up, which I think is kind of on the important side, uh, or at least the interesting side, I should say. Alan Leopold, who is a listener, he got his day saved by one of the emergency fixes that I mentioned on the show in episode 46, 30 episodes ago. And this is crazy. Listen to this. Hi, Tim. I started listening to your podcast a couple weeks ago. Today, I was riding our local trail, that's the 400 trail, and listening to podcast 046 when my rear derailleur broke just as I was listening to your advice. I carry tools, and within 15 minutes, I was heading back to my truck with a fixed gear bike. I would say this is one of the craziest coincidences I've ever run into. I love your podcast, and I'm binge listening to get caught up. Keep up the good work. And I've got a picture in the show notes of him uh, and his bike uh, kind of set up as I, I, I don't think that would be a fixed gear so much as it would be a single speed um technically because I, I think you could coast since you've got that the the way it all works with your bike but semantics aside uh that's pretty amazing i mean i'm i'm super happy and i'm glad that it was helpful that uh that information got out there and was used but the absolutely strange alanis morissette ironic coincidence it's not really ironic um it's alanis morissette ironic that's just crazy that that Alan was listening to this episode when he needed it the most. So sometimes things happen for a reason, perhaps sometimes the universe is full of coincidences. I don't know which side of the pole you're on on that, but I thought that was pretty cool. So Alan, I'm glad that that was able to work for you. I'm glad you're digging the show. Thanks so much for writing in and telling us all about that. If you uh, are interested in some emergency fixes, go back and check out episode 046. That's pedalshift.net slash zero four six so if you're uh if you haven't been binging the show see what can happen see what can happen when you binge the show very magical cool things can happen and you can 
find yourself fixed up because of this very podcast. Who knew? Uh, glad that was helpful and uh, hope it's helpful for the rest of you. Next up on the show is the journal, and we're going to kick off the journal by talking about the CNO adventure I had with Bell Star. Oh, let's see, almost two weeks ago, and I have to say, it went so well in so many ways, and it was so different than what I was expecting in other ways. And I think I learned more on this trip in some ways than I expected, or than I would ever have imagined would be the case for a trail that I've written so many times before, and this section in particular. Um, it, nothing I did was different except for bringing Bell Star, and it's interesting how you change one variable on a bike tour and how that can really have a major impact on things. Um, so anyways, enough of the preamble. Let me talk a little bit about some of the things that I learned on this. A um, little bit of backstory. I talked about this on a prior episode of the show, but I took the train out from D.C., to Cumberland, Maryland, which is the end of the CNO, also the beginning of the gap or the end of the gap, depending on your point of view. It's the, the sort of the junction of the two places. Um, the issue that I knew going in was that the weather wasn't going to be as ideal as I would have liked. It was going to be cold on a couple of nights, and I knew that going in, although as we'll talk about in a little bit, uh, the degree to which it got cold, I, I was not expecting, and it was not properly forecast. The other thing was that I knew that there had been some rain on the trail segments, uh, including a pretty heavy day of rain. I believe it was on the Wednesday before, so a couple of days before I went out there. And I went out there on a Friday, wasn't intending on doing any riding on Friday, but was going to start in earnest on Saturday. Um, so that's sort of the basics. I was going to be, uh, take the train out and ride all the way back. That was the basic idea. So I get into Cumberland on Friday night, and the sun was setting in about a half hour. I had lights, and I got to the point where I was just sort of... Ordinarily, I would have gone right to camp and just kind of shut things down, but I was kind of ready to have a beer and have a nice dinner. I had Bell Star with me, and of course, um, most places that serve food in many places around the country, around the U.S. at least, don't allow dogs in. But Bell Star is such a low profile dog, and she's so happy and content inside her Sherpa bag, which is the, what I was traveling with. And um, I thought, okay, well, why don't I just take her in? I've done this in places like New York City and other places around here in the D.C. area. And she's perfectly content to just be down by my feet and uh, chill out there. And that's what we did. So we went to the Krabby Pig and um, everything was all good. And she was quiet and nobody knew the wiser and everybody was happy. So uh, I started off and I, I think I ended up putting up a picture of the inaugural beer for the uh, the tour. And that, one, uh, that, was a, that was a good way to kick things off. Um, they were about ready to wrap things up and close not long after I was done. So I uh, loaded Bellstar back up on the bike and we rode to the YMCA in Cumberland and we stayed the night there and uh, woke up the next morning. It was, it was a bit on the chilly side overnight. And as I mentioned, you know, the forecast had been for chillier temperatures, but um, it was not too bad. I, I had plenty of stuff. And of course, you know, when you're with a dog, it, you've got the combined body warmth and all that other kind of stuff. So that went very well, and uh, I found that the the Cumberland YMCA is a really nice place to kick off a tour. You got you got to pay twelve bucks, which you know from a camping perspective, a lot of people uh, say no to spending money to uh, sleep on the ground. Basically, the one thing that was really nice is that it was drizzling that night, and for me, I was all set to go to Evitts Creek, which is the first campsite on the CNO. But when given the choice between having wet gear and a wet tent to pack up in the morning and not, um, the picnic shelter that is part of the campsite at the YMCA was the thing that sort of beckoned to me. So I decided, you know, why don't I spend the money and be there? And I think that was the right choice for me that night. So um, got up the next morning, got a bit of a late start. Uh, in, and there, was, there were a variety of reasons for that, but got a late start and rolled out of town and got things all together and finally started down the trail. It might have been close to 11 a.m. Um, I, you know, all of the different things that I learned on this trip, one of the things that I learned is that with Bell, 
getting up and out early didn't really happen the way that I expected to. Normally, she wraps us up very early in the morning here at home. But when I'm out in the tent, she doesn't. She's perfectly content just (laughs) staying in the tent for as long as possible. So that sort of got us to a late start. And that was one of the things that had an impact later on the day, of course. So during this time of year, it's early enough in the spring that I don't have, you know, 10, 12 hours of sunlight. It's a lot less than that. So as I was uh, working my way down the trail, um, I was noticing that the the clock was ticking a little bit more. I think that the number one thing that I noticed with her is I went a lot slower with her on the bike. And I'm surprised I didn't think about this before going. I knew that she was more weight. I knew that there would be consequences to that. But I've done so many shakedown rides and didn't notice that I was going a lot slower with her. I mean, I think I was going a lot more purposefully. And of course, I'm, I'm focused on her safety throughout all of this. Um, the The consequence of having her on the front of the bike means that some of the weight that I keep on the front ends up on the back. So it, it changes the the weight structure of things around. And what I noticed was for the first 30 miles on that day, eh, everything was fine. I got up to the Papa Tunnel. It was all great. It all worked. It, it was fine. Um, I was hydrating and eating just great. But miles 30 through 60 were a slog. And what I noticed on the few days that I was riding was that the first 30 miles felt fine. But because of the extra weight and um, also just the nature of where her weight was made it harder to kind of steer. Not that I had to steer a lot because I'm on a trail, but it did create a different cycling situation. Again, you know, focusing on on the safety of the scenario, you know, I'm I'm putting a lot more effort into all of these things as I cycle. So much harder with the extra weight. And I found that I was about, well, let's see, I I would normally go about 10 miles per hour. I was probably traveling no more than like seven and a half or eight miles per hour. And that, of course, adds up over time. Um, I wasn't I wasn't traveling very fast and the fatigue level went way, way up compared to what I'm normally handling. And you would think that I would know that and that I would be, with all the experience that I have over the years, have figured it out. But because of my shakedown rides weren't any more than 30 miles each, I didn't realize that, that there was going to be that kind of a fatigue buildup on the second half of these rides. So that was a huge takeaway for all of this. I mentioned the Papa Tunnel on the first day uh, I got there. It was April 1st, which was supposed to be the date that the National Park Service was uh, looking to close the Pawpaw Tunnel because they're going to be doing some uh, rock scaling work on the uh, DC end of the tunnel, basically. Um, This is right around mile marker 155 or so, give or take. So it's about 30 miles in from Cumberland. So as I got there, um, I was really, really hoping that the tunnel would be open because I knew that the uh, consequence of going up and over the mountain on the trail, even though they've uh, opened up a fire road that is a little bit flatter, that that would be a lot more effort and a lot more time. And I could, I was looking at the clock. I knew that I was kind of behind on my day, and I knew that the sun was setting at 7.30, and Hancock wasn't any closer uh, uh, based on the speed that I was going. Well, it turns out the, the uh, tunnel was open, which was great, um, but I also ran into the guy, Preston Page, who did a video of that trail prior to me going. Well, strange coincidence, he was there that day as well and was doing another version of that uh, trail ride because he had, he had messed up the turn or done something something that he wanted to clean up a little bit. So I ran into him and I said, hey, thanks for putting up that video. That was really helpful because at least I knew what I was in for. And uh, I've got a link in the show notes to Preston's video. And I actually ended up uh, being, I was able to say hello to him on Facebook as well recently once he put the same video up on Facebook. So anyways, go check this out. It's over on YouTube. Preston did a great job there if the CNO is in your plans. Um, And if not, it's actually kind of cool to see it. And you also get to see what the vista is like at the top of the ridge there as well. The reason exists, by the way, is because the, the 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 mountains cut through where the river is at that point, and uh, there was no way to dig a canal any further because the mountains go right up to the side of the river. So it, it, it's a an area of the river that wouldn't have been terribly navigable uh, for this barge traffic. 
So they weren't going to just rejoin the canal, the canal to the river and hope that they could kind of wind their way through. They figured, nope, we're going to, in this early day of tunneling, uh, do a tunnel all the way through and actually build a canal through this freaking mountain at Papa. And it, uh, it worked out. It took them a while to do, and it was kind of a technological marvel. I think I've said that on the show a few times. And it's always really interesting to go through. Now, this was uh, Bell Star's first time going through the tunnel, and it was, oh, boy, I've gone through at least a half a dozen times or more, perhaps. But I was a little concerned about whether or not she would be freaked out. Well, she was a champ. She was just sort of looking at me the whole time. I had my headlamp on, and I'd look down at her from time to time, and she was just looking up at me. She's like, yeah, this is cool, even though probably the smells in there must have been kind of horrifying because it's this really musty-smelling place. I figure for a dog, it was probably overpowering, but eh, she was fine. She was all good. So, uh, other side of uh, Paw Paw Tunnel, I get up, and um, I'm very happy because I'm like, okay, cool. Now I can start to make up some time. I had a little lunch break. Uh, I was still feeling pretty good at that point. And then it is just a hot mess on the other side. The, this is the side of the tunnel where they're going to be doing this rock scaling work. And there's like sort of uh, rock slides and just uh, waterfalls, and it, it's a bit of a mess on that side. One of the areas where the towpath was sort of reconstructed included a bit of a step down, enough of a step down that me and all of my weight on my rear wheel caused a pinch flat within about maybe 200 meters on the other side of the tunnel. When, of course, that was just a really bad time for it because it's, you know, there's water everywhere. There's waterfalls coming down. It's sloppy. It's muddy. It's wet. And of course, I've got Bell Star, who I don't want to uh, have any problems with. Well, is it, I could see a dry spot, maybe another 10 feet up. So I rolled up to there, flipped the bike over. And as we know, whenever I get a flat, it's always in the rear wheel because of course. And so I uh, got the wheel off, got the, uh, got the tube in. It probably took me maybe about 20 minutes, half hour at most when all was said and done. It was, it was a little bit longer because of the nature of the, the area of the repair. And also just trying to make sure the Bell Star was going to be in a safe space. So she was fine. I think she was more fascinated with anything. I got a fun picture of it. You could check out the show notes for a picture of that. So that set me back, like I said, another probably half hour or so. And I was already sort of racing the sunlight as it was. Originally, I wanted to get into Hancock and uh, get some food and then go to one of the campsites. There's a campsite on either side of Hancock, a couple of miles on one way and about four miles on the other side. And that was sort of my intention. Well, between all the delays getting started, the delay of the flat. Oh, I ran into another guy, actually. And I don't know if he's listening to the show. I never got his name, but uh, I helped him with his flat way earlier in the day. So, you know, I, I was I was delayed in lots of different ways. Uh, and I was super help, happy to help out anybody who it was in need on the trail with uh, some repair help. So that that was a, a good choice on my part, I hope. And um, but it's, still, you know, all these things conspired to have me run out of daylight. And I was also getting back into cell phone signal range. It's a bit of a cell phone hole around the Papa Tunnel area, um, at least for at t uh, customers such as myself. So I get uh, back into cell phone range and I think, oh, uh, let me check and see what time, remind myself what time the sun is setting. So I go to Dark Sky, which is my weather app, and I see that the low for tonight had been downgraded. Uh, low for that night was then 33 degrees Fahrenheit, which is right around freezing for you uh, Celsius types, uh, zero degrees Celsius. That is at my comfort margin edge. Um, I have a bag that can handle it, but I just looked at Bellstar and I couldn't, with good conscience, have her go through a night that cold in a tent. And so at that point, I was really starting to get fatigued and I was really starting to get exhausted. And despite all of that, I was not going to, have her be in a campground in a tent, even though every fiber of my being was like, Hey, stop at the next campsite. Let's just end this. Even though we're on the, on the wrong side of Hancock, let's, you know, just end this. I just was like, no, I got to get her to a warm place. And I thought, you know, this might be a good opportunity to say, you know what? It's a hotel kind of night. And so I ended up at a hotel in Hancock and I ended up coming in quite a bit after uh, the sunset. So I had my lights, which was good. Um, but I'll tell you what, that was a really exhausting way to end the day. I uh, found myself really depleted, managed to get into Hancock at about oh, 8.30, 8.45 or so, got some food, 
um, at the Sheets gas station, <laughs> which it was high end cuisine, I can tell you, and uh, ended up at the hotel. And that all worked out. Got the last room in that hotel. There's, I think, a couple of hotels in Hancock. Not, not, neither of them super fancy, but um, there's a nice B and B I keep hearing about. I think called River Run, but um, the hotel there was dog friendly, so I was able to get her in, and it was the last room. So that was that was fortunate. Um, watching the national championship game, the end of that that was that was kind of fun. Um, but I was beat. I mean, I was beat. And I woke up later than I wanted to the next day. And this was sort of just pretending things to come as things were going along. Um, I think that the lesson for all of this was my mileage was too high for riding with Bell. And so normally when I do the CNO trail, as you all probably know, I'll do about 60 miles. I'll, I'll – Split the, the the trip up into three pieces, three 60-mile days. It's 184 and a half miles. It's actually a little bit more than 60 miles on some days. But there are good spots to stop. It's, you know, start in Cumberland, go to Hancock, go to Harpers Ferry, D.C. Well, that was just too much mileage for three days with Bell, as I discovered. And that end of the first day and the beginning of the second day, I was fine. But my fatigue grew much faster on the second day, again, at about 30 miles, but it really hit hard there. And so that was the point in time when I was realizing that uh, doing the trail with her is more of a four or even a five day type of scenario. Because what I was doing was I wasn't having a lot of fun. I wasn't able to stop the bike and kind of play with her, or, you know, you know, just uh, walk her around a bunch, you know, enjoy the campsite. No, it was more of kind of the that Batan Death March kind of bicycle tour, which can be fine on some days and if you're really trying to push yourself. But if you're trying to do this to kind of get away, to have some fun, maybe enjoy some time with your dog, man, that just was not how this trip was going. So I discovered that uh, end of the first night and into the second day. Um, one thing that I also discovered on uh, the trip was that Bell Star, I brought a different type of food for her than I normally give her, but I did test it with her first. And that was a, it's a freeze dried food. Basically you add a little bit of warm water and then it rehydrates in three to five minutes and, and uh, you know, uh, grain free, all that good stuff. And she liked it here at home. But when I tried to feed it to her <laughs> on the road, she was not as interested in it. And in fact, I had to kind of goose it up with some beef jerky to make it even remotely okay for her. So when all was said and done, I think one of the other lessons that I take away from this is don't mess with the dog's food too much. Um, since she didn't like the freeze-dried food on the trail and was fine with it at home, I ended up with a bit of a surprise. Luckily, I was able to get uh, some food that she was more used to and much happier with um, at the Dollar General of all places in Hancock, and she was much happier from day two on. So if you're going to be touring with your dog, I would say don't mess with the food too much. Um Day day two continued, and um, the thing that I found was around the 30-mile mark, I started to get really fatigued again. And I was realizing that it was creating an issue for just my enjoyment of the tour. I also was starting to think about what the next day was going to be about, and I had a whole bunch of kind of job-related things that I wanted to get back to. I thought, oh, I'll be back kind of in the mid-afternoon if I go at my normal pace. And when I realized, not only am I not going to be able to get back at the normal time that I expected because of the speeds that I was going, but that I would be dead freaking tired when I got back, that I started, it really started getting in my head. And that's when I was like, you know, you got to ride your ride. And sometimes you're sort of like, you know what? I think I've had enough. I think that this tour is going to be over. So I decided to end the tour in Shepherdstown which is a super dog friendly area. And luckily Kimberly was able to come out and uh, pick me up and we all went back and we had a nice dinner out and it was really good. And uh, Bell star got rewarded with one of her favorite things in the world, which was a little bit of vanilla ice cream and a dog, a dog biscuit that we can get at one of those Sonic drive throughs. Um, So she was super happy. She got her reward and it all ended up working out really well. So we had a great time even though we didn't finish the tour the way that was originally planned, I still think that it went really well because I learned so much as we go along. One of the things that I learned in addition to the things I've talked about is you got to be focused on safety first always, especially when someone else is reliant on you. And I think this is true whether it's a dog or it's a kid or it's a friend who's never done bike touring before or somebody who's super experienced, maybe more experienced than you. 
focusing in on safety. I tested and retested my setup with Bellstar a lot. I mean, I mean a lot. I tried all different types of things. I tested and retested, and there were trade-offs for her comfort and her desire to watch me the whole time. Because seriously, I'm here to tell you, she would not put up with the trailer because she couldn't see me very well. And she wanted to be able to lay eyes on me the entire time. And so that's why I chose what I chose. But um, her safety was always paramount with all of this. And it was always a concern the entire way through, which is why I did the hotel night that, that first night. Um, I'm not normally a hotel night kind of person. And if it had been just me, I know I would have just said, oh, it's going to be a chilly night. I'm just going to bundle up and wear extra clothes and you know wear a hat and my hood or something like that. But with her, I was like, ah, I just don't want I just don't want to put her through that. So that's why we did the hotel night. Um I think that the overall takeaway for this is, first of all, I'm definitely going to ride with her again on multi-day trips, but I'm absolutely going to dial back my riding expectations. It it sort of goes without saying that you would ride differently when you've got another person or another dog or another animal with you, especially when you're hauling them. And I sort of intellectually knew this, but it took me to do this tour to realize how much of a change that was. And it was solely about weight impacting um, my energy and my speed. And those two things really, really do impact how many miles you can do in a day. And when that happens and it throws off what your plans are, you got to roll with it. And that's what I ended up doing. So we ended up calling it a little bit early, but we ended up having a good time. And I think that I learned so much. I know I'm going to apply this for future tours with her. I'm definitely going to take her out on the CNO again, probably this spring, probably this summer, something like that. And I'm excited to do it. And now I think that we're going to have a little bit more fun doing it because I think I'm just going to tamp down the expectations. It'll be much more about the experience of riding shorter sections of the trail and enjoying the campsite, enjoying all of that time together. So that's that with the uh, Sino with Bell Star. Next up in the journal is a really fun uh, note that I got from listener Ann Wilhelm. And Ann is a relatively new listener to the show. And I'm just going to read her well, she called it a tour journal. And I thought that it was it was perfect because it really was a helpful a uh, rundown of the Katy Trail. Now, the Katy Trail I've talked about in the past before. It is in Missouri. It spans most of the state. It's from basically the outskirts of Kansas City to the outskirts of St. Louis. And I'm really, really intrigued with this. And I know that um, some folks, uh, friends of the show, are are interested in maybe doing a ride, uh, maybe even together um, at some point in the future. I think that's really interesting and intriguing. I, I might think about doing something like that. But I know that I want to do the Katy Trail. So we'll see how this all, all works out. But uh, the interesting parallel with the part of the journal we just got done with is that Anne rode with her dog as well. So you get two things out of her report here. One, a really good insight into a trail that is spoken of as highly as some of the trails that I've talked about, the CNO, the Gap, uh, even the Pacific Coast Route. Um, plus, you get the experience of bringing along a dog. So without further ado, I'm going to be reading uh, from Anne's note. Good morning. I stumbled upon your podcast about nine months ago and have been catching up on past episodes. I began listening to episode 62 during uh, this morning's 20-minute commute to work and thought I'd shoot you a quick note to tell you about my recent tour since it relates to two topics discussed on that episode. Uh, I just finished a semi-self-supported tour with my dog on the Katy Trail. I'm a special ed teacher, and my dog, Harley Sue, is a certified service dog. This was our spring break adventure from uh, March 18th through the 26th. Harley is a Border Collie mix. So she weighs a bit more than your pugs. Yeah, definitely. Uh, therefore, my best option for taking her on bike tours is using a bike trailer. We did 60 miles on the Katy in July using a Schwinn children's bike trailer with the children's harness removed. But the floor is fabric and slanted, giving me concerns about its comfort on a long distance tour. Therefore, I purchased an Aosom, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, Aosom Elite Pet Bike Trailer on Amazon. I put a nice padded bed in the trailer, and she seemed really comfortable. The Katy Trail is crushed limestone. It's a great trail and is typically very well maintained. I live about two hours from the trail, so I've experienced it in all weather conditions. Spring is one of the tougher times to bike the trail because the winter thaw and spring rains tend to keep it a bit mushy. During the summer, the trail dries out enough that it's almost like riding on pavement. So that's a good bit of tip from Anne about your timing on doing the trail, the Katy Trail. Uh, Anne continues. Harley Sue and I started our adventure in Clinton, Missouri, 
and finish our first day of biking in Sedalia. That's 36 miles. I had a friend drop us off in Clinton. She then took our stuff to Sedalia, where a few more friends joined her to bike out to meet in Green Ridge. I typically bike five to six miles and then let Harley Sue out to run a mile or so. I typically use a bungee leash to attach Harley's harness to my seat post. When we were away from roads and by ourselves on the trail, I let her run besides me off leash. And that's against the rule, she says. <laughs> um, I've seen some of these um, harnesses and things like that uh, on the CNO, and I've seen them in various places uh, for sale as well. I've heard really good things about them. I believe uh, we heard some good things about that harness from uh, 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 Jasmine Reese and her dog Fiji. I think that she uses that when she has Fiji running alongside as well. Uh, and continues. The beginning section of the Katy Trail is mostly surrounded by grasslands and prairie. That just sounds awesome. That's a, a, a ecosystem a type of type of land that I don't get to see very often. And when I do, I, I just always find it so beautiful because it is unique to my what I grew up with. So I always love. I mean, that's one of the things I'm excited about with the Katy. Anyways, and continues. The first 9.1 miles are close to a highway before heading into the trees for another 7.5 miles. The recent rains made the trail soft and crosswinds kept my average speed around 8 miles per hour without carrying all my own stuff. The marker for the highest elevation on the trail can be found between Windsor and Green Ridge. And by the way, take a look. Uh, there's a great look at the show notes to a map so these towns can give you some context. And continues, I did encounter some loose dogs at Windsor. They chased us from the moment we got to town until we arrived at the trailhead and I got off my bike. Thankfully, Harley was in the trailer during this chase. That's kind of funny. I hear a lot about people being chased by dogs on, on bike tour, and I haven't really had that, certainly for that extended of a period of time. And I know it, it, it bothers a lot of people, um, but I... I uh, I haven't experienced it all that much. I've, I've usually been having good luck with dogs um, on bike terrain. I know that's in the minority. And continues. The trailheads on the Kitty Trail are really nice. They have great descriptions of the history of the area and give a preview of trail highlights that riders should look for as they bike. They have a bench and a roof that provides a bit of protection during mild rain. From November to mid-April, all of the water is shut off along the trail, and many of the bathrooms are closed. They do put portable toilets at most of the trailheads. Also, most restaurants are closed on Mondays during the winter season. Many are only open on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. So there's another bit of a tip if you're going to be doing it during the uh, winter time as well, uh, for you. By the way, winter is during this time of year. I've looked at the weather. It, it, that part of the country, it does not stay very temperate. It can get really cold. So it doesn't sound like it's as inviting, although I'm sure a lot of folks do try it out. I'll bet you it would be good on a fat bike during that time of year. Uh, and continues. The remainder of our tour went well. We battled a headwind ranging from 16 to 27 miles per hour for the first six days. That is brutal. <laughs> Temperatures on our trip range from 41 degrees to 87 degrees. We managed to outrun a thunderstorm arriving to Tebbit's shelter, only one on the trail, moments before the downpour and hail started. I was extremely excited to find that the hostel was stocked with coffee and a coffee pot. I cannot recommend the Tebbit's shelter enough. It has 40 bunk beds. Wow, 40. Showers, bathrooms, a bicycle repair shop, a kitchen stocked with peanut butter, jelly, bread, coffee, coffee pot, cups, microwave, hot plate, toaster oven, grills, cooking, and eating utensils. All this for a $6 donation. That's fantastic. Um, that reminds me a lot of, of um, a couple of the camp opportunities on the Gap Trail, although those are free, um, but those don't have these kinds of amenities. That's that's really fantastic for 6 bucks. Tebbets, T-E-B-E-T, I'm sorry, T-E-B-B-E-T-S, Tebbets Shelter. Check that one out if this is on your itinerary at all. And continues, I learned that it takes a lot of energy to haul 115 pounds on a bike. Yes, you and me both just recently. Way more than I anticipated, she says. Carrying and eating enough food was a challenge. We stayed mostly in hotels or bed and breakfast, so I didn't carry a tent. But I did carry four to six liters of water each day, food for both of us, and clothes for every weather. I even ran out of water on my 42-mile day in 87-degree heat. Thankfully, Cooper's Landing, which is a campground at a small store in Easley, was open so I could purchase water and snacks for the remaining nine miles. Harley Sue was a trooper through the whole adventure. However, on day six, she just seemed off. She didn't want to get out of the trailer and run. Thankfully, a friend was meeting me at the trailhead 16 miles away. We battled 27 mile per hour headwinds for three and a half hours. I'd eaten most of the food I was carrying, only a half a banana left and arrived at the trailhead with blurry vision and dizzy. Harley was so excited to see my truck that she ran straight to it and refused to get out for the rest of the day. <laughs> I love that. 
dogs, man. Uh, my friend got me something to eat and took me to a trailhead further east so that I could finish the day's remaining 18 miles with the wind. Harley was feeling better by the next morning and biked with me for all but six miles. I spent two days exploring in St. Charles so Harley could rest, and I avoided biking during a day of thunderstorms. We finished the last 12 miles to Machen's. I think it's pronounced Machen's. Forgive me if I'm not. Am I Missouri? And if it's Missouri, then I apologize for that, too. I'm not from the area, as you can probably tell. Uh, Machen's, the end of the trail, on Sunday morning, and then made the four-and-a-half-hour trip back to Kansas by car. We biked 241 miles and spent 42 hours on the trail. I assume that's 42 saddle hours. It was a memorable experience, but I don't think I'll bring Harley on another long bike ride. She's getting up in age, nine years old, and I think the long days on the bike are just a bit too much for her. While she loves going places and being with me, I think she just couldn't relax enough to get good sleep while I was biking. I took a pop-up kennel with me, and she could sleep better at night, but she continues to be tired. She also didn't want to eat her dog food, but was willing to eat some of my food. I was able to get her eggs at some of the hotels. That And that's such my experience with Bell Star as well. She wanted my beef jerky way more than any of the food that I gave her until I gave her the food that she was really used to. Uh, to I, I had a lot of similar experiences as you. Anyways, uh, and... and uh, uh, and Harley Sue sign off, live life to the fullest and enjoy the ride. Uh, and Anne and Harley Sue are from Lawrence, Kansas, beautiful place. And uh, check out her site, work in progress. She says cycling through life.com. And thanks so much for sharing that. I really appreciated reading about the Katie trail and also your experiences. I, I read this about the same time as, after I came back with bell star. So, so many of your experiences I had on the CNO just a few days prior. And so it was interesting to read the same experiences and have the same takeaways as somebody else with uh, riding with a dog. I'm also really intrigued with the Katy Trail. It just sounds like a really fun, great ride. So for those of you who are looking for a ride, the Katy Trail looks like to be, it's a really good one. Um, and I've heard so many good things about it. And I'm really excited about the prospect of doing it someday. Maybe this year, um, I'm, I'm keeping, keeping it open as an option. One thing that's problematic for me is, as I've talked about on the show, I hate heat so much. And so in the teeth of summer, I know that Missouri, having been to Missouri a few times, is not exactly the low humidity, low temperature kind of place during the summer. So I don't know how much I would enjoy doing 60, you know, stringing together a bunch of 60 mile days. But um I might, I might give it a whirl anyways. I might, I might see what I can do about that if uh, a summer tour is possible on the Katy. Um, it's, it's certainly a place that I'm really intrigued in doing. I think that the fall sounds like it's a really great time and maybe uh, kind of the mid to late spring. Actually, probably starting in the not-too-distant future, it sounds like May is a really good time to go. So if you're kind of uh, out there with a little flexible time on your hands and you're looking for a tour somewhere in the U.S., especially the middle of the U.S., I'll tell you, take a look at the Katy Trail. This sounds fantastic, and I just keep hearing good things about it. So um, thanks, Anne, again for sharing that. And for all the folks out there who have been proponents of the Katy Trail, thanks for pointing my way to it because uh, it looks like a good one. It's a time when we close out the show with a big thank you to the supporters of the show through the Pedal Shift Society. If you like what you hear, you can keep me, keep the show listeners supported while expanding the offerings. That's a few bucks a month, uh, five, two, one, whatever it works for you, or you can do one shot or annual support as well. It doesn't have to be monthly if you don't want it to. Go check it out, pedalshift.net slash society. And society members, pedalshift.net slash stickers. I've got a whole bunch of them coming out. I know I've been so far behind. They're coming, I swear. On to the society. Ethan Georgie, Kimberly Wilson, Caleb Jenkinson, Cameron Lane, Andrew McGregor, Michael Hart, Josiah Matthews, Keith Nagel, Brock Dittis, Thomas Skadow, Michael Risica, Seth Krieger, Marco Lowe, Terrence Manson, Noah Schroer, Harry Talgatis, John Sikorsky, Richard Killian, Chris Barron, Scott Taylor, Brian Wren, Mark Van Ram, Brad Hipwell, Paul Mulvey, Stuart Buckin, Todd Stutz, Mr. T, Roxy Arning, Nathan Poulton, and all anonymous and past contributors for making the show happen. Thank you for joining. You can find Pedal Shift at pedalshift.net. Lots of great content. You can hear the Pedal Shift Project through iTunes or your favorite podcast aggregator. Opening music courtesy of Jason Kent off his debut album, track is called america check out his band sunfield's latest release habitat wherever cool music is available 